want to thank everybody for being here. I want to thank everybody for watching. I need to make this announcement once in a while. If you're watching this on YouTube and you've not subscribed to our channel, please do hit the like button and uh, have a good time. God bless you this morning. Amen. Everybody said praise the Lord. Well, we're thankful for you being here. Turn with me in your Bibles to the Sunday school classes you may go. Luke chapter 2. I know Christmas is over, but the Lord give me a thought I want to share with you that comes from the Scripture story, but not, does not necessarily have to have a Christmas theme. Amen. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord showed round about them. And they were sore afraid. The angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Peace on earth. Peace on earth. God bless you. You may be seated. There's not a person in this world that oh, I should, that's, that's a wrong statement. There are some people, but they are in a minute minority who do not want peace. Everybody that we know of and we who are here today, we would like to have peace on earth. Ever since the Garden of Eden, there's always been conflict. When they just had four people in the garden, one of them killed the other one. There's always been conflicts. And as we move closer to the end of time, I believe that according to the Word of God, we realize that world peace is something that's going to be non-existent because it teaches us that the closer we get to the coming of the Lord, that there are going to be wars and there are going to be rumors of wars. And there's going to be nation that's going to rise up against nation and brother against brother. And we, we realize this, that world peace seems to be an elusive dream. I remember as a uh, young person growing up in the 60s, that was a different world ago. Back in the early 60s and the mid 60s, there was there was that was that was when the peace sign first began to come out, and and people began to protest for peace, and and we were sick of war at that time, and and we were tired of it, and we we got tired of it, and the world uh, they got sick of it, and and our music when I grew up in the 60s, our music that we listened to had an anti-war and had a peaceful theme and a desire. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. And where have all the flowers gone? And on and on and on. We could talk about songs that came out of our generation because we were sick of the wars and the things that were going on. We didn't want that. We just wanted to be left alone and have peace. Amen. And it never happened. It just went from one to another. And in our cities today, it seems that crime is on the constant increase. And violence has become a part of everyday living. So when we look at our world and we see that there are violence and we see that there are wars and rumors of wars and we see that there are all kinds of uprisings and nations against nations and, and, and I don't have numbers in front of me on this but I am sure that, that domestic disputes are probably at an all-time high. There's probably more infighting in homes where that ought to be a safe place. There's probably more conflict there. And that's, and, and that's just a part of our life. And that's a part of our world. So, so world peace seems to be an elusive dream. And, and, and breaking it down to home, as we said, in our crimes, in our cities. And, and violence has become an everyday part of life. So then when does the peace that the angels proclaimed at Jesus' birth. When does that become a reality? And where does that become a reality? If the angels would declare peace on earth 
and good tidings to all men. One translation, the original translation, or the closest translation, where it says, and good uh, goodwill towards men, meaning and goodwill towards the men that are right with God, to the people that are right with God. It brings that, that level in there to us. And, and so when does that peace that the angels proclaimed at Jesus' birth come into reality? We may never have world peace until the millennial or the millennium dispensation of time. Well, that's kind of a downer on this holiday season. And well, the angels got it wrong. <laughs> no, the angels didn't get it wrong. But we have to understand that there is a prince of this world Amen. whose goal is to just keep everything stirred up and to keep people at odds with each other. But when the Lord's angels declared, peace on earth, we, we have to understand that we need peace in our lives today like we've never needed it before. Amen. Right. Now I'm going to give you some things and I'm not preaching at anybody, and please don't anybody take this as a personal affront from me and saying, Pastor is mean-spirited. No, no, Pastor is not mean-spirited. Pastor is trying to help us today. But I believe today, when I read some things that we really, that I'm going to share with you, we need world, we, we need peace in our world. We need peace in our life like we never have needed it before. Because anxiety disorder is the number one mental disorder in our world today. An estimated 275 million people suffer from anxiety disorder. It ranges from anywhere from 4% to 6.25% of the world's population have anxiety. Have anxiety. And it can follow many different courses. There can be many different types of this anxiety. And here's some of the things that goes on. And apprehension is one of them. Worrying about future misfortunes. Don't have a clue what tomorrow may bring, but we lose sleep and we have anxiety worrying about what might happen. Not what is happening, but about what might happen. Feeling on edge having difficulty concentrating on what I'm doing today because I'm apprehensive about what might happen this year. Apprehension is, the, is, is one of the courses that that anxiety can follow. The second thing is, is what, the, what the doctors call motor tension. Motor tension, meaning a restlessness and fidgeting, tension headaches, trembling, and the inability to relax. Anxiety. Anxiety. Autonomic overactivity is the third course that anxiety can run. And it brings about lightheadedness, sweating, abnormally high heart rate, or abnormally high or rapid breathing, stomach pain, I'm just sick of my stomach, dizziness and dry mouth. And every one of us has felt some of those things at one time or another in our life. Here's, a, here's an interesting statistic that I read when I was beginning to look at some of these things, that by the year of 2030, that's just eight more years away, the cost to the global economy of all of the problems that are brought about by anxiety could amount to $16 trillion. Sixteen trillion dollars with a T. That's a lot of money just in our world global economy because people have anxiety. And the angel proclaimed that when Jesus came, he would bring peace. We think it means that China will quit wanting to have war with Russia or Russia with us and, 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 and China with Taiwan and Hong Kong. No, 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 no. I don't believe that that's what, because the scripture says that the closer we get to the end time, the more wars and rumors there's going to be wars. But it said through Jesus Christ, there would be peace on this earth. And I want to break it down to, if I can today, that we have a personal relationship with God that goes beyond China's relationship with Taiwan. And if I have a personal relationship 
relationship with God and he has said that when he came, he would bring peace, then I believe that that peace bringing, brings it to me that in my life and in your life, we need to have the peace of God in our life. Let me look at a couple of verses if I can about peace on earth. The first one is John, uh, 1 Corinthians 14 and 33. It says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. In other words, He's the, he's the author of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. God is not the author. In other words, He didn't write the confusion. You know what an author does? An author writes the book. He didn't write that. He didn't start that. That's not the script. That an author sometimes just doesn't write a book, but he'll write a script or a plan. He, he didn't write the confusion. No, 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 it can't happen. God did not order that. I looked at this whole scripture from 1 Corinthians 14, in context with what he said and, and what he had to say about everything that was going on and what he was talking about. He was dealing with confusion in their worship. Oh yeah, you read that whole scriptural text and you know what he was talking about? He was talking about get this right in your communion. Get this right. He was talking about tongues and interpretation. He was talking about how that when there's tongues and interpretation in the church, let it be no more than two or three at the very most. And let every time, let there be a single interpretation. In other words, if somebody gives tongues, let there be an interpretation. If there's tongues, let there be an interpretation. He said, you don't come into a church service. He said, can you imagine how confusing that would be if you come into church service and it was nothing but tongues? If it was nothing but tongues and interpretation and you got ready to preach and you had ten tongues and interpretation. He said, no, it don't matter if there's five people there or 5,000 people there. He gives the structure. And there's nothing wrong with tongues because Paul said, I'm glad I speak in tongues more than you all. He didn't say there's anything wrong with tongues. He didn't say there's anything wrong with prophecies. He didn't say there's anything wrong with praying in tongues. But he instructs us because he says, you need to understand something. God is not the author of confusion. And that everything we do, he said, let it be, oh, he said, let it all be done to the edifying or the building up. You know what confusion does? Confusion does not edify. It tears you down, it pulls you down. Amen. Confusion comes from the word unquietness or tumult. It's upsetting all of the time. So many times, if we can't get our walk with God and our worship right, then it will naturally, the natural result will be confusion in our life. You want to know who's the most confused in life? Somebody who's trying to play both sides. There was an old country and western song. It just popped in my mind. I don't know where it come from. Back in, back in the day, the Oak Ridge Boys had a song that they sang and it was kind of a tongue-in-cheek song. Trying to love two women is like a ball and chain. You just better call them both baby. Because you can't call one baby and one sweetie and not get them. I, I didn't use nobody's name. Did you notice that? You, you can't. You, can't, you, you just got to be careful when you're trying to love two women. It's like a ball and chain. You know what's like a ball and chain? It's trying to live right and not living right. Amen. Trying to pick. I'm going to live right in this area, but I'm not going to live right in this area. You know what it does? It brings confusion. It brings confusion when you tell God you love Him with all of your heart and you come into the house of God and your worship level is zero. I love you with everything I've got. Then let's raise our hands and worship the Lord. Not me. Not me. I'm not going to do that. Why? Because that's just not who I am. So it brings confusion in our life when we can't... Oh, yes, it does. It brings confusion. You want to know what a person has a right relationship with God? Why they can go home and they can sleep and they can have contentment. They can live their life and they don't have to worry because they know their heart is right with God. And if your heart is right with God, it stops the confusion. It brings the peace and the harmony and that our life needs and the soundness we need in our life because God is not the author of that confusion. But He is the author of peace. Paul was dealing with all this stuff in the church and he said, God don't start that confusion. 
God doesn't bring confusion. He brings peace into our life. 2 Corinthians, in his second letter to this church, in chapter 13 and verse 11, this is what he says. He says, finally, brethren, finally, brethren, farewell. In other words, he's closing out his letter to them. And he says, finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And if you'll do these things, the God of love and peace shall be with you. So let me just, for the sake of conversation this morning, and I don't have a whole lot I want to say, but let me just break this down a little bit at a time if I can. Finally, brethren, farewell. He said, I've written this letter to you. This is my second letter that I've written to you. And he said, I, I've, I've, I'm, I'm writing this letter to you. And he said, this is my farewell. This is my farewell. I'm done. Goodbye. So he closes it with this. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. All right, let's look at this. Be perfect. Oh, yeah, I'm not perfect, Pastor. No, when you look at the word perfect there, you understand what that means. That speaks of spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity. That, that's what it means when the Bible says, Be ye therefore perfect as he is perfect. He's not, he's not saying be without flaw. There's not a person in this place that can have the peace of God if you have to be without flaw to have it. Oh, then I'm going to let this, we all my, this is, oh, give it the old bob of the head. Yeah, because if there ain't none of us perfect, because as Jesus looked at those religious people and said, you that are without sin cast the first stone. We're not nobody throwing no stones, but we got enough knowledge, or I started to say common sense, spiritual common sense, to understand that if you start living for God today, there's got to come a point in your walk with God that you mature. Amen. Don't you think we ought to grow up in God? We understand that these precious children that left and went out into their Sunday school classes, we don't want them to act like old people. We want them to be kids. Don't mean we turn them loose to just be complete heathens, but we have to discipline and train them and teach them. And to don't. I was someplace the other day. I can't remember where I was at. I, I don't even remember. I don't go enough places now. I ought to be able to keep track of it. Somewhere. But I was someplace unimportant, apparently, the other day. And, and somebody said, uh, oh, I know where I was. I was getting my hair cut. In my old barbershop, I tried to forget that place. <laughs> That's where I was at. And, and they had some music on. And the owner, she said, I don't care. I told them it's one of those services where you speak into the speaker, you know, like, Lexi, play this and this and this. And it'll start playing. And she said, I told them to play, uh, she said, I told it to play music that doesn't have bad words in it. And she said, so they started playing some kind of rap music. And she said it was hard. So she turned it to this here. And she said, there will be no rap music in here. And I laughed. I said, that's what my dad said about rock and roll music when I moved out. <laughs> there will be no rock and roll music in my house because I was the baby. I left. He wasn't going to listen to Grand Funk Railroad and, <laughs> and, and Creedence Clearwater. He wasn't going to listen to that stuff. There comes a point in our walk with God you say, what's that got to do with this, Pastor? What it simply means is there's one thing when I was a kid and I did things compared to what I do things now. I can't, my dad, he wasn't going to expect me to live like an old man and listen to Roy Acuff all the time. <laughs> some of you say, who? Yeah, ask some old timers who was. Yeah, and all that other stuff. But, but what, what it is, we better have some marked levels of maturity in our walk with God. We need to be able to grow up in God. And Paul says when he was telling them to be perfect, he was saying grow up, 
mature, develop in God, let your walk with God grow in Him to where you can look back and say, as, and Paul said at one time this way, he said, when I was a child, I acted like a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. He wasn't talking about how that he used to go out and play cowboys and Indians in the woods. He was talking about when he was a child of God, that when I was first started living for God, I may have acted one way, but now that I'm acting, now that I have grown up in God, I act a different way. I like to think I'm a little different than I was when I first started living for God. As we grow in God, there must be a growing up in God. Amen. A sign of growing up and maturity is not being so easily offended. I mean, you just you just wear out dancing around everybody's feelings because if you if you if you say boo instead of bye, you you're going oh, but didn't offend them. Well, dear Lord, let them grow up. I have a 17 year old boy home who's sick, but if every time his sister told him something, he sat on the floor and put his fist in his mouth and cried. I'd go in there and say, what is the matter with you? Amen. Get over it. Move on. Let's go. Get up. Do something. We need to grow up in God and quit letting everything the preacher says and everything everybody does just, just upset us so much. Grow up. Quit. But that's a childish thing. Oh, I shouldn't have preached this on a holiday. But, but grow up to the point that we're not easily offended and everything just doesn't offend us. Amen. I'm just going to stop right there and go to the next point. But we're going to have to grow up in God because we're moving into the end time. And, and the, the, the Bible says that if you can't keep up with the footman, what are you going to do when the horsemen come? And the horsemen are on the way. The horsemen are on the way. We're living in unprecedented times. And this is no time to sit around and, and, and be sensitive to every little feeling. The second thing he says is be of good comfort. Be of good comfort. Say comfort. Be of good comfort. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. And I'll tell you, there's something about when a child wakes up in the night and they have a dream or there's something scares them, a noise scares them. What do they do? You that have children, you know what they do. They come right into your room. And they're standing at the edge of your bed and they're shaking the bed saying, I feel something. And how many times have, no, it's okay, it's okay. Over the years, how many times have you said, well, then get up here. Right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Has anybody ever done that besides me? Has there, I'm scared. I heard something out there. Well, then get up here. You're 20 now, but it's all right. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Get up here. A little kid, look at you. You know what I'm talking about. It's, it's all right. And we, we tell them to get up here in the bed with us, and we snuggle them up in there. We just, we just do that. That's just what we do. And you know what they do? They'll instantly go to sleep. They'll reach over, and they'll grab you, and they'll cover, and they'll snuggle up next to you. And they're gone. They're not worried about the noise of the dream. They're just snuggled up there and they're comforting you. Let me explain something to you. If you're going to make it through this life, you're going to have, this is a, probably a crude way of saying it, but you're going to have to learn how to snuggle up next to Jesus. You're going to have to learn to snuggle up to Jesus. You're going to have to learn how to get close to Jesus because when life starts getting rocky, when it starts getting to be a mess, Paul said, be of good comfort. Be of good comfort. Not bad comfort, but be of good comfort. Learn to get in the presence of God. Learn to get close to Jesus. Learn to do that. That's why the Bible talks about praying in the Spirit. I believe that the more we learn to pray, in the spirit the closer to God we're going to be able to come learn to get in the presence of God because there's something about being in the presence of your heavenly father Amen. 
We grew up not in the projects. I always tell you, we grew up one block from the projects, and we lived in a little bitty house, and we didn't have no locks on the doors. We didn't have no air conditioning. We just raised the windows and put a screen up or opened the screen door and let the wind blow through. And, and we lived one house, right? There was a railroad tracks on one side of us and a highway, a major highway through Illinois was, was, was about 150 feet from us and a railroad track on this side of that and a housing project next to us on that side and another highway that went through that. We was kind of right there. But I never one time worried about somebody getting into my house because my dad was on the other side of that wall. And I could go outside and sleep in the yard in the summertime because I knew who was on the inside. Because every once in a while, you know what would happen? I would look up when I was sleeping out in the backyard. That's what city kids did in the summertime. We just took a blanket or a sleep bag and, and just went out in the backyard and slept. We called it sleeping out. And we just slept out. And I didn't worry about it. I didn't worry about it. You know why? Because every once in a while, I'd wake up and I'd just see somebody standing out there looking. And it was my dad coming just to make sure that we was all right. And I thought, there ain't a man or a person in this world that's an idiot enough to come in that house when my dad was in there. And you know what I did? I took good comfort in that. Our problem is we can't have peace in our life because we've never learned to snuggle up close to Jesus. We've never learned to get into his presence where we can feel his arm reach out and touch us and say, it's going to be all right, my child. It's going to be all right. You don't have to be, you, you can have peace in your life. Why? Because you're in the presence of the Lord and there ain't a devil in hell that's got enough meanness about him who would dare jump into the presence of the Lord when he's got you wrapped up in his arms and, and, and you can stay right there. We need to learn, we need to learn, we need to learn to get into the spirit to where we can be comforted by the Spirit of God. He says He would not leave us comfortless. Be of good, good comfort. And He said you need to be of one mind. Be of one mind. The more ease we are with each other, the more ease we will have within our hearts. You know what it gets... You know what gets some people all upset and all flustered is, is their relationship with other people. Oh, you get upset in your own heart because you're upset with other people. Brother Williams is my friend. You've been my friend for 30 years. We don't have nothing against each other. But if we was at odds with each other, how could I have peace if I can't get along with my brother? You know what the Bible says? The Bible says that if you can't love your brother whom you have seen, how can you say you love God whom you haven't seen? How can, if you can't get along with me and I can't get along with you, if, if me and Eli, we don't have anything against each other, do we, big guy? I hope not. That's right. I hope not. You're getting too big. I'm getting too old. If, if me and Eli, we can't get along together, how can I have peace in my life if I can't get along with him? I don't have to agree with everything he does. He doesn't have to agree with everything I do. Amen. Our differences of opinion don't have to bring us to where we can't get along. Right. You may like pinto beans. I may like navy beans. You might just like beans and weenies or something. I don't know. But we can't we still just be friendly? We're not talking about doctrinal issues here. We're not talking about whether there's one God or three gods or, what, or tongues or no tongues. We're not, we're not talking about that stuff. You know what we're talking about? We're talking about just how the, that the Bible says that we just need to be in one mind. We need to have one mind. We just need to realize that, that we just got to stop this. How blessed is it when brethren can dwell together in unity? Isn't that what it says? The more we are with the, the more easy we are with each other, the more ease we will have within our own hearts. Amen. The more ease we are with each other, the more ease we will have within our own heart. That's what Paul said when he said, be of one mind. One mind. You see, the church has one purpose. 
and that's to get as many people to heaven as we can. That's our mind. Everything else is secondary. Well, you're going to have to think on that one for a while. The more ease we are with each other. I'm amazed at how, how at the stuff that we, we allow to cause division. I'm just amazed. And I'm not talking doctrine. I'm not talking standards. I'm not talking any of that type of thing. I'm talking about, about petty stuff. Whether they like salt on their watermelon or not. Who cares what you put on your watermelon? Live in peace. Be of one mind. Our goal is to get to heaven. Our goal is to get as many people to heaven as we can. Our goal is to have good church. And if it's working and it's in the boundaries of the Word of God, then what difference does it make if it's coming out? Well, if it ain't coming out of my stack, it ain't even smoke. That's nonsense. That's just nonsense. One mind. Then the, the last thing he says is, he says that we need to do, we need to live in peace. Don't allow the difference of opinion to alienate us from people that we love and that love us just because we have a different opinion. I want to say that again. Don't allow differences of opinion to alienate us from people that we love and that love us. Now, I'm, I'm probably the most, from this pulpit, I am probably the most non-political person you've ever been around. I don't get off on that. That's, I can't find where God says to vote for Republican. I can't see where he says vote Democrat. He just, he's the king. We're a holy nation unto him. So that's why we vote secret ballot. So I'm, I'm going to, t with all of that in mind, I'm just going to tell a little personal story. Okay? I was raised by what we used to call, what they used to call yellow dog Democrats. My dad would vote. He was, he was a railroad union man to the day he died. And he had a poll call him one time. And he, they asked him, they said, are you a Republican or a Democrat? And my dad grew up in the Depression. And so you got to understand, this is a different generation and different thing. And they said, are you a Republican or a Democrat? He said, I'm a Democrat. And they said, how Democrat are you? And he said, if you cut me open, he said, little donkeys will start coming out of me. <laughs> he said, that's just through and through. He said, I'm Democrat from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. He said, I'm just Democrat. He said, and he said, but I don't just vote for the party. He said, I vote for the man. He told me that one time. He said, I don't just vote straight Democrat. He said, I go through. I said, who was the last Republican you ever voted for? He said, I never have voted for one because he said, I never found one better than a Democrat. And I'm like, okay. Now, my son, on the other hand, Josh, he was a Ronald Reagan Republican to the nth degree. <laughs> he believed the government was supposed to do nothing but provide roads and a military. He was a Republican. Stay out of our lives. Let us live our lives. And he was, he was that Republican. And that's why when he was in Washington, D.C., he enjoyed that. When he worked for Roy Blunt in Washington, D.C., those two times he went up there, he enjoyed that. that he had a college degree in, in government. He was, he was all about that. That was his thing. And, and when he was just a little boy, my dad would come down here and visit. And when Josh was 10, 11 years old, he was smart enough then, he would start arguing politics with my dad. And, I mean, you talk about two worlds colliding. That was FDR and Ronald Reagan, just boom. <laughs> and so one time I pulled Josh over to the side. I said, son, let me explain something to you. I said, you ain't ever going to change Grandpa. And Grandpa ain't never going to change you. So the best thing you can do when you're around Grandpa, don't talk about politics. I said, leave it alone. 
But he said, I'm right. I said, I know you may be. He thinks he is and you think you are. But I said, for the sake of your relationship with your grandpa. My brother one time got in the car when he was a little kid. And, and my brother's gone on to be with the Lord. But when he was, he was a little kid, they used to have in our hometown, the storefronts would be filled with uh, the politicians would have, like the storefronts would be like an empty storefront. They'd make it the Republican headquarters for that town or that county. And they'd have all kinds of stickers. My brother didn't know the difference. He was about 10 or 11 years old. And he was uptown. And he went in there and he brought a whole bunch of that Republican stuff outside, bumper stickers and posters and all that stuff. And he brought them in. And my grandpa and my, and my, grandpa and my dad picked him up uptown, and he got in between them. They opened the door and let him get in between, and he just set that stuff down by my grandpa. And my grandpa, you'd have thought it was a snake. My grandpa was like, get that stuff away from me. Get that away from me. Don't let that stuff, don't let that Republican stuff touching me. <laughs> and so my brother had to cool it in that area. He didn't know. He was just getting some cool bumper stickers to put on his bike or something. He didn't know what they was adding them to him. Take this home to your dad. Take this home to your dad. He didn't know what he was doing. He might have been, might as well have been bringing whiskey home, you know. <laughs> he didn't want none of that stuff in our house. But you have to learn, like I told my son, your opinion on a non-essential is not worth a division of the family. We don't have this problem here, so I'll use it as an example. But I've seen churches divide and split over whether they sing out of a songbook or off of the wall. And we used to use that term, singing off the wall, before we got screens because we put it on overhead projector and people would go, yeah, their music's off the wall. <laughs> and, 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 and divide churches over that. That's a preference. That's not a doctrine. Don't make a doctrine out of a preference. And if, if that's where God has called you and saved you and they put it on the wall, sing it off the wall. If they hand you a book, sing it out of the book. What difference does it make? We've got to learn to live in peace. Our world is filled with drama. I want to make a statement here that I don't care if you like it or not. It's true. I hope you like it. I hope you agree with me. But anyone that brings you into their drama is not your friend. Anybody that will tell you something that has nothing to do with you that's going to cause you to have bad feelings towards that other person, they're not your friend. Boy, this is, this is quite a little deal. I hope somebody on YouTube is liking this. This might be for you. That's right. You go to the book of Proverbs. There's listed six things that God hates, and he says the seventh is an abomination. We talk about all kinds of things being abomination, all kinds of perversions and cross-dressing and, and all kinds of things that are abomination unto God. But you know what he says? He calls an abomination that would stir up strife amongst brethren. If me and Brother Richard are real close friends, and we are good friends, even if I don't see you when you're driving down the road and you're waving at me till I get right on top of you, I don't see nothing. I'm, I'm an old man, forgive me. And, and me and Brother David Hubert get into it, and for him to come over here and say something to him that would make him question his relationship with me, that's an abomination. In the eyes of God, that's the same thing as sexual perversion because it's an abomination. Oh, dear God. Well, I had to tell somebody. It just made me feel better. To tell. Why didn't you pray about it or come to me about it? Amen. If you got a problem with me, don't go to him. Come to me. Amen. Well, I just had to tell somebody, well, you were wrong. You were wrong, and whoever done that to you was wrong, and they were wrong in the eyes of God because what that does, then that brings you into their drama, and that brings you into their drama, and that creates confusion and a lack of peace, and it brings conflict into your life. We ought to try to avoid drama. Avoid it. Just stay away from drama. Stay away from the fuss. Stay away from the confusion. 
So now I come to my conclusion. If we do this, he says, if we will grow up, get close to God, and keep one mind in purpose, and stay out of the drama, and live in peace, live in peace with everybody as much as possibly lieth within you, and sometimes that just means you got to stay away from some folks, because some folks are always going to be up in the air about something. There's, there's just some folks you can't get around because it's going to be problems. It's just going, they're going to tell you stuff and they're going to do stuff. He said, but if you'll stay away from that stuff, he said, if you'll grow up, if you'll get close to the presence of the Lord, if you'll stay focused and live in peace, then he said, the God of love and peace will be with you. It seemed like this week as I was studying this, every time I would put my notes down and, and I, even after I had them typed out, it seemed like that every time I'd open my Bible or I'd grab a book of any kind and read it, it would just be boom, there it would be, just more of the peace of God, peace of God, peace of God, peace of God. Colossians 3 and 15, we won't put it up, but it says, let the peace of God rule in your heart. Let the peace of God and let... Now, if, if Brother Hubert says, I'll buy your lunch, he won't buy my lunch unless I let him. Because he can say, I'm going to Flat Creek, and I'm going to buy your lunch, and I'm saying, I'm going home. He can sit down there and wait all day long, but until I walk in there, he ain't buying my lunch. Because I won't let him buy my lunch. Am I right? Let let, let, give him permission. Let, give permission for the peace of God to rule in your heart. You have to give him permission because peace is the fruit of authority. Peace. You don't think so? Look at our cities who defunded the police. And they've got tyranny and chaos and craziness going on. Yeah, peace is the fruit of authority. Let the God of peace rule in your life. To rule means to have authority. Let God have authority in your life and the natural result is peace. If you will let Him have dominion and authority in your life, it's His authority. Ephesians 2 and 14 says He is our peace. He is our peace. Not our money in our bank and not our house and not our car and not our position and not our clothes and not our family. Not even my wife or my children are not my peace, but He is my peace. Amen. First Thessalonians. Did I give you First Thessalonians, John Mark? 5 and 23 says, The very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to understand something here. The very God of peace, let this God of peace that, that we have allowed to rule and to have authority in our life, allow Him to sanctify you wholly. That means your whole aspect of your life, your whole spirit, your soul and your body will be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord. You see, what He does for us will eventually bring Him glory. You want to bring glory to God? Let Him rule in your life. You want to bring God glory? Let Him bring His peace. Let His authority be in your life. Right, amen. Amen. You see, when you let God's authority, then it's up to Him. He's responsible, and you have to make the choice to allow this. You have to make the choice. You know why they made the, this just clicked in my head too. You know why they made it real easy to call for help by, by having a number 911 because everybody can remember that. It's easy. They don't say call 417-694-3428. I don't know what those numbers are. I just made them up. But I don't know what they'll get you, but... 417-777-7777 will get you a trial lawyer because I've seen it on a billboard. 
I don't need him, but I seen it on that big billboard, you know. And then you go another mile farther, and there's another lawyer who says he can get you more. So I, I don't know about that, but what I, what I am telling you is that if, if I go home today and I start smelling smoke coming out of the back, if I pull up in the driveway and there's fire coming out, I'm not going to sit here and go, I got this! Get that hose out of the garage, hon! Where's it at in there? I don't know, but it's in there somewhere. Dig it out. I had it all drained and put away for the winter. Get it out. In the meantime, that smoke is just rising up in the black. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to reach in my pocket. I'm going to get my phone. I'm going to call 911. And when they say, what's your emergency? I'm going to say, my house is on fire. If I have a chest pain today that won't let me get up out of my chair, I don't need my wife to say, well, let me get you some coffee, honey. No, call 911. I'm hurting. Call 911. You know, it's that easy. But, but when it comes to the spiritual things and the peace of God, why do we think we don't need Him? I got this. No, you don't got this or you wouldn't be in the mess. You don't got this. You need Him. Let Him, the God of our peace, let Him, let Him, let Him. 911 has got operators today sitting there doing nothing but waiting on your call. God is waiting on your call. God is waiting on you to let Him rule in your life because He is the God of peace and the fruit of His authority. He's called the Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. The Prince of Peace. He brings peace when He is the Prince. And a Prince is the ruler. What do we call Satan? The prince of darkness. Oh, we don't have no trouble identifying with the dark. We say, oh, that's evil. That's evil. We look at something. We can identify that as evil because that comes from dark. Why don't we then learn to rally underneath the flag of the prince of peace Amen. and say, God, I know this year is going to be, uh, everybody says, you know, this, everybody says, everybody says, I know everybody says, everybody says. Who depends on who you listen to? Everybody says, everybody says. Let me, let me 